Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at a meiosis overview, prophase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, telophase 1 and cytokinesis, prophase 2, metaphase 2, anaphase 2, telophase 2, and then we'll finish with a summary. So meiosis is very similar to mitosis and it's another type of cell division, but there are some important differences in the function and the general overview of this process when comparing it to mitosis and you need to be aware of the different steps. So essentially the process or the function of meiosis is to create haploid cells. So the haploid cells that we're talking about in most cases are the gametes that have half of our genetic information which then would fuse later on to form a new organism to bring those two halves together to form one whole set of DNA. So the way that meiosis works is it does two stages of divisions. So it's divided into meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. So what happens is if you think about just to recap our genetic makeup in, for example, a human cell. So we have 23 types of chromosome, and each one is in a pair. So we have 26 pairs of chromosomes. So for number one, we've got two chromosomes. Number two, we've got two chromosomes. Number three, etc. This is what happens in a normal body cell or a diploid cell. In mitosis, what would usually happen is that these would just copy themselves and then divide into two new cells. In meiosis what happens is these copy themselves but then they split and then they split again. So they end up splitting into half of what they originally had, forming four gametes. So just to illustrate that into a diagram here, we've got a full diploid cell here. So this would be one chromosome pair that's been copied. This then splits so that each new cell gets one of those copies of chromosomes. So this might for example be chromosome pair number one. and then. Because chromosome pair number one has one from mum and one from dad, that needs to split into two so that it's divided into half. So this one splits into two gametes, and then this one splits into two gametes as well. So these gametes, of which there are now four, are haploid, and what they would do is they would fuse with another gamete during sexual reproduction to form a full cell, so that each pair of chromosomes now has that copy from mum and copy from dad again. So the first main stage of dividing, or the first division, is known as meiosis 1. So this is the one that comes just after the chromosomes have copied themselves during the interphase stage. So as we said before, this could be, for example, representing chromosome pair number 1. And in the interphase, the chromosomes copy themselves. So this would be interphase here. So that each one of chromosome pair 1 now has a copy. So for example, if this one was from dad and this one was from mum, we now have a copy of the one from dad and a copy of the one from mum. So now there's four types of chromosome 1, but they're all exactly identical to each other. So in meiosis 1, what we have is the cell divides and it splits into two during various different stages, and it's similar to the stages found in mitosis, and the homologous chromosomes, i.e. those ones that line up with the same genes, become separated from each other. So as we said, the copies from dad go into one cell, and the copies from mum go into the other cell. And then shortly after this, the division is followed by meiosis 2. So in meiosis 2, the sister chromatids are now separated from each other in the next phase. So now we have these two separate cells where we've divided the chromosomes into two. This one splits in half, and then this one splits in half. And then you've got these four gametes, which each have half of each pair of chromosomes. So each gamete will have one of each type of chromosome all the way from 1 to 23, but it will only either have the mum or the dad copy of that chromosome pair. It won't have a complete pair, so that when it fuses with another gamete, it will add another half of this so that each pair gets their second half, and then you've got 23 pairs again. So as we just said, the purpose of meiosis 2 is to produce these gametes. So at the end of meiosis 2, we end up with four sets of genetically different cells each with a haploid number of chromatids within them. So this is one of the main differences between mitosis and meiosis. Not only do we form gametes, but the cells that are made are genetically different from the original cell, whereas in mitosis it's a complete clone and a complete copy. The purpose of this is, is so that in sexual reproduction we get random variations and combinations in genetics to produce offspring with a chance of having better genetic advantages than the previous generation. So talking about meiosis 1 then, let's talk about prophase 1. So prophase 1 is the first stage in meiosis. This is very similar to the prophase found in mitosis. The chromosomes and the DNA within them start to supercoil and become condensed and visible. The nuclear envelope breaks down and the spindle fibers form from the organelles known as the centrioles. 
So here we can see the nuclear envelope breaking down. And the purpose of this is to allow that genetic material to now be moved around the cell accordingly. These are the centrioles, and their job is to create these fibres which are known as the spindle fibres. The chromosomes then go over an important process in meiosis called crossing over. So in crossing over, DNA is exchanged between the chromatids of the homologous chromosomes in a pair, and this happens in prophase 1. So let's explain what's happening in a bit more detail. So if you remember at this stage what we have after replication is that every pair of chromosomes has now been copied. So pair number 1, we had originally in the diploid cell a copy from dad and a copy from mum. And what happened during interphase was that this times by 2. So we ended up with two copies from dad and two copies from mum. Remember, so each of these is a chromosome 1, and the alleles on mum's donated chromosome might be slightly different to dad's, but overall the genes on each of the chromosomes are coding for the same overall feature. So what happens in crossing over is that in this scenario, so here we've illustrated this as being like this, these two blue and two yellow chromosomes, the sections of DNA that are the same genes get exchanged between the homologous chromosomes. So we get certain parts which are swapped over between the copies from the mum and from the dad. And this is really important for genetic variation. So the homologous chromosomes, first of all, they line up together and they end up twisting around each other so that the genes that are the same on the same loci become close together. Say this is pair number one out of 23 and we've got the copy from dad replicated and the copy from mum replicated. They twist around each other and they bring the genes that are on the same place close together because remember, even though these are all separate chromosomes, they're part of the same pair. So the gene found here is coding for the same proteins as the one found here and here. So on the same site, they all code for the same thing. The only thing that might be different is the alleles. But they're brought in close proximity to each other so that they can be swapped. So the wrapping or the twisting around causes sections of the chromatid to break off and then they can be swapped over to the other homologous chromosome. So what we end up with after the twisting is that it breaks off and then after that they can be swapped around. So that they now all code for the same genes at the same place, but what this allows is exchange of different versions or alleles. And this is how meiosis is important because in creating offspring we want to introduce variation so that we can pass on new advantages. So as we said, because the chromosomes are homologous, the crossed over chromosomes have the same genes as before but the alleles become shuffled, and this introduces genetic variation around lots of different chromosomes. And obviously this can happen at lots of different points, lots of different genes and loci, and over the 23 pairs, this creates a huge amount of variation. So this is a really important process you need to be familiar with. So an important mechanism in meiosis is known as crossing over. Meiosis is very important in introducing genetic variation to the offspring, and this is a mechanism by which it can do this. The purpose of crossing over is that it acts as a mechanism allowing some alleles or versions of genes to be swapped between homologous chromosomes, and it occurs in meiosis 1. So remember overall we've copied our chromosome pairs, and then these get split into two cells based on whichever takes which pair. So in crossing over, certain sections of DNA are exchanged between the homologous chromosomes. So remember if we were to take this as being pair number 1 out of 23, we had the copy from mum that was replicated and the copy from dad which was replicated. So for example, each one was replicated. And remember, on a chromosome in a pair, at the same loci, you have the same gene coding for the same protein. So this site, for example, on chromosome 1 might code for a protein found in the eye. And whether it's on the mum's copy or the dad's copy, or the copy of those, then the gene will still be the same thing. What differs is perhaps the alleles that are found. And what can happen is crossing over of a gene to another copy, so they basically get swapped, which is illustrated here. So the homologous chromosomes first of all just line up with each other, and they twist around at the point of which they're going to be crossing over. So you can see the twisting here. So the wrapping or the twisting up can cause the sections of the chromatid to break off, and then they get swapped over to the homologous chromosome, and then they've exchanged their DNA. So we've got a wrapping over here, bits of it break off, and then they get swapped with each other. So now these both still code for the same genes, but the alleles may have been swapped around. So because the chromosomes are homologous, the crossed over chromosomes still have the same genes in the same places, but now they have different alleles. So remember, on a chromosome, the same place codes for the same gene, 
on the homologous pair. So both of these still have these certain genes, but what we now have is potentially a difference in the alleles. So crossing over introduces genetic variation, which is really important because all of the alleles are shuffled around on lots of different chromosomes at lots of different sites. And if you can imagine overall, there's 23 pairs of these. There's a lot of variation in every time meiosis happens. And obviously the combinations are phenomenal. So there's a huge combination of shuffled alleles. And this is beneficial to evolution overall. So back into meiosis one, when we talk about the next stage, we're talking about metaphase one. And this is where chromosomes end up lining up at the equator. And again, this is very similar to mitosis stage of metaphase. So we've got metaphase as the second stage here. So the first step involves the attachment of the chromosomes to the spindle fibers made by the centrioles, and they attach at this central point known as the centromere. So here we have our chromosomes, and we have the centromere in the center, keeping it all together. And these spindle fibers are able to attach at the centromere to now start moving the chromosome back and forth. So each chromosome lies to the homologous partner at the equator, and it's really important that they keep lined up. So for example, we've got 23 pairs of chromosomes in the human body. This might be pair one lining up together. So they all stick to whichever type of chromosome they are. Within the homologous pair, the chromosomes are randomly organized on either side of the equator. So this is known as a process called independent assortment. So independent assortment means that one could go on either side. So the blue one might be on the left side instead of the purple one, or we can have the blue one on the right side. And if you imagine this happens all the way down to number 23, again, we have huge combinations of independent assortment. So again, this is introducing variation. The next stage following metaphase is anaphase one. So this involves separating the homologous chromosomes to the opposite poles. So again, this is very similar to the third stage of mitosis. So in anaphase one, each chromosome from the homologous pair is pulled apart to the opposite ends of the cell. So remember we have our, say, pair number one here and then pair number 23 all the way down on the other end. And then each chromosome from a pair gets pulled to one end of the cell. So this means that one pole of the cell has one to 23, but it has one set of chromosomes, and the other pole also has one to 23. So this is why it's really important that they line up with their homologous pair, because if they didn't, one pole of the cell would end up with certain numbers, but not others, and the other might end up with too many of one number. So it's really important that they each have one to 23. Where the randomness occurs is that one out of the pair of homologous chromosomes will end up on each side. But as we said before, which of these could be random? So we have obviously our pairs lining up in order from 1 to 23. But for example, with this pair on the bottom, we could have the purple one lining up on the right hand side, or we could have the purple one lining up on the left hand side. And if you imagine all the way between 1 and 23, there's a huge combination again of orders in which they could be swapped to whichever cell and this will affect what genetic makeup each of those gametes has later on. So again this is introducing more genetic variation. The last stages of meiosis 1 is telophase and cytokinesis. So in telophase 1 we have the reforming of the nuclear envelope and this is again very similar to mitosis. In animal cells they reform a nucleus for a short period after anaphase 1 has occurred in telophase. So you can see the nuclear envelope forming around each set of genetic material. And also the cytoplasm splits in the process of cytokinesis. So you can see the cytoplasm kind of pinches in at each side. And overall, the cell splits into two separate entities. In plant cells, it's a little different. They keep their two separate nuclei, but they go directly into the next stage of meiosis without splitting into two separate cells. So after meiosis one has finished, what we're left with is two cells and two sets of segregated chromosomes. Now we need to go through the stages again, but now they're numbered number two instead. So in prophase two, the DNA supercoils again and becomes visible, and this happens for each of the cells. The nucleus disintegrates, or the nuclear membrane disintegrates, and then the new spindle fibers form again. So again, it's very similar to prophase one. We've lost the nuclear envelope, we've got condensed genetic material, and we've got spindle fibers as well. So again, very similar to prophase one. So this is the same as mitosis, except that the chromatids on each chromosome are no longer identical because of crossing over. So each of the cells now has two chromosomes for every type of pair. And what they've got now is chromatids, but instead of being identical, they've now exchanged genes with the copy that was with them earlier. So each chromatid here will have slightly different alleles to the one 
next to it. This is the main difference with mitosis. In metaphase, or metaphase 2 specifically, the chromosomes line up at the centre through the attachment of spindle fibres to their centromeres. So again we've got this lining up process whereby all the chromatids line up at the equator. The chromatids are randomly assorted into either side of the equator. So these will get pulled to the different poles in anaphase 2, but the random assortment means that certain ones will go to the right side, certain ones will go to the left side. So again this introduces diversity again. In anaphase 2, the genetically different chromatids are randomly segregated to the opposite poles. So the spindle fibres contract and they take one from each of the chromatids to one pole and then to the other. And remember this is happening in both cells. And then finally we have telophase 2. So after anaphase 2 the nuclei start to reform and then the cell splits in cytokinesis. So again each cell has now formed two new nuclei. The spindle fibres have gone away and the DNA will start to redisperse. So for animal cells each cell will split into two making four cells. So what we now have is that each gamete now has half the genetic material. For pair one of the chromosomes it will have just one copy, for pair two it will have one copy, and after crossing over all the different combinations and alleles will be massively varied. So we'll have four gametes and each are haploid. In plant cells we've got a slightly different setup. After meiosis one they didn't split into two cells so now what we have are four nuclei which aren't separated by plasma membrane yet. So the cell has to split four ways to then make the four cells. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face and together let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.